God bless you. This is Pastor Danny Jefferson, pastor of the Rehoboth World Outreach Center Church, inviting you this Sunday to come and be a, my special guest at our drive-in service. We're having another drive-in service, and we would like for you to come to be with us. Our service starts at 11 a.m. this coming Sunday, uh, and our address is 245 Holly Street in Vallejo, California. 245 Holly Street. Now, listen, if you come, listen, you got to stay in your car. This is, we we are complying with the laws of the land. We're gonna have social distancing. You got to stay in your vehicle, but I guarantee you, if you come, God has a word for you. And remember, uh, you belong here. So come and bring a friend with you this coming, coming Sunday. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you. I give you glory. God bless you. We want to welcome you tonight for our Bible studies. Listen, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for you on tonight. Praise God. We give, give God praise for all that he has done. We are just glad for you to tune in tonight into our video streaming of our Bible study tonight, and we're going to get to the Word of God. Just want to welcome you tonight. Um, let's uh, take a moment to bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy towards us. We give you praise because you're an awesome God. And God, we just, there's none like you. And God, we just decide to keep on living in spite of our situation, in spite of our problems and circumstances. God, we decide that we're going to keep on living because you have given us the victory. And because of that, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. Father, we thank you, Lord, what a joy it is to to sit around your word tonight. And God, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And God, I ask that you give us revelation knowledge that we might be able to not just be hearers of your word, that we might be doers of your word, and that our, ble our deeds are blessed in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. God bless you tonight. We want to welcome you again to the Rehoboth World Outreach Center. Glad for you to tune in tonight as we prepare to get into the word of God. Tonight, of course, we uh, always take this time to uh, equip you with the word of God, equip you with the word of his grace. Amen. Great grace unto you. I'm uh, also very happy to be here tonight. Um, I just kind of give you, before I go to my word tonight, I'm standing in our dining hall, and in our dining hall we have pictures of uh, some historical pictures of our past. My father was the pastor and founder of this church, and I uh, had the pleasure of succeeding him as pastor. And so we have many of the pictures back in the 60s and the 70s, and even uh, the 80s and the 90s. This pulpit that I'm using here tonight uh, is very historical in itself because our church is almost 70 years old. This is our original pulpit. This was the podium which my father preached for many, many years before we got a, a different podium. And so, um, and so I wanted to use this tonight. Uh, standing in front of these historical pictures, uh, I'm going to use this historical podium tonight. A lot of great men preached behind this pulpit. Those that were part of the Church of God in Christ, we had Bishop J.A. Blake, um, which was a great friend of my father. Many of the old bishops and, and uh, pastors preached behind this pulpit. So it's had a lot of mileage on it. Still, it's very sturdy and still works very well. In fact, I believe um, Brother uh, Pierce, uh, Mother Ciola Pierce's husband was the one who put this together. He crafted this. It was either Brother Pierce or it was Brother Raymond Johnson. Uh, I believe it was Brother Pierce who put this together. And so it has meaning. We've thrown away a lot of the, discarded a lot of the old furniture of the church, but I wanted to always keep the pulpit. And so uh, that's what I'm preaching from tonight. So listen, we want you to get your Bibles tonight and we're going to go straight to the word of God. Amen. Um, we want to invite you, we've already seen the commercial, but we want to invite you this coming Sunday to our drive-in service, and that's at 11 a.m. 
Uh, we're asking, uh, listen, we're going to have an awesome time this coming Sunday morning. Uh, you can drive in, amen. You have to stay in your car. You have to stay in your vehicle because we want to make sure that everybody is safe and sound. However, we are going to be worshiping the Lord. We, the praise team will be here. We will be ministering the word of God on uh, Sunday, but it will be at the drive-in. We're going to drive in. We're going to honk our horns. We're going to praise God. We're going to hump when it's time to say amen and all the rest of that. And so we're going to have fun on this kind of coming uh, Sunday morning at um, 11 a.m. 245 Holly Street here in the city of Vallejo, California. And we are praising God for that uh, in advance. So turn with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 verse number 15. Amen. And the Bible says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul tells Timothy here in this passage of scripture, uh, And that from a child, you were taught as a child from your grandmother and from your mother, Amen. You were taught from a child. What? You were taught the at, thou has been taught for as a child, thou has known the holy scriptures. Amen. And I shared with you on uh, the last few times that the holy scriptures is the old testament because those was the only scriptures of that time. You've known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee what? Wise. Not just wise, but wise unto salvation. Wise to what? Wise unto salvation. And so he says, salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. Romans chapter 1, number, verse number 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. What is the gospel? He says that the gospel of Christ, amen, for it is the power of God, amen. We can talk about the power of God in many ways, but the power of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of Christ. And he says it is the power of God, what? unto salvation. This power that the gospel produces is to bring salvation. Amen. He says, not only that it will bring unto, unto salvation to everyone that believeth. On Sunday morning, I took the time to ask the question, well, are you a believer? Are you a believer? And, and uh, uh, basically the, the genesis or the, the summation of that whole message and sermon was to say that what constitutes a, be a believer or what qualifies one to be a believer or what qualifies one to be saved or what qualifies one to be a saint is that they believe on the gospel. And we told you what the gospel was on Sunday, that it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, I let you know and I gave you uh, ample scriptures that all one had to do is believe. And you know, that's very important for us to know today because in some circles, some people believe that there's more to salvation than just strictly believing. Believing on the gospel is all it is. It's as simple as that. Amen. It's not believing the gospel and do this. Believing the gospel and do that. It's not believing the gospel and do, get rid of this and believe the gospel and get rid of that. No, it's just believing the gospel. That's what brings salvation. And so he says, he says here in this scripture, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone to who? To everyone that believeth. That is the qualifying factor for salvation. Just believe it. 
to everyone that believes. That means that anybody that has ever been saved, anybody that has ever been born again, anyone that has ever received Christ, all they had to do is believe. We have made salvation so difficult. When I say we, religion has made salvation so difficult when all you had to do in order to be saved is to believe. Simple as that. Amen. Then he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the gift that keeps on giving. The gift that keeps on giving. You'll understand what that thing means in a few minutes. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 1. Verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Amen. Here's his mission statement. For he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. <laughs> and so the major message of the Bible, as has been said, stated many, many times, is salvation. That is the message. It is not uh, a motivational book, even though you can get motivation from it. It is not a book teaching you how to uh, uh, manage your finances, well, even though you can get some good wisdom on managing your finances. It's not how to grow your business, even though you can get some principles out of it, how to grow your business. It's not how to do all of these things. The major message of the Bible, the only message of the Bible, is salvation. Amen. And that's what the Word says. Paul told Timothy that, that the, the scriptures were uh, to make the wise unto salvation. Amen. And so uh, Jesus came that we might be saved. Amen. And then he said that his mission came that he would save his people from their sins. That is the entire message of the Bible from Genesis chapter, from Genesis to Revelation is salvation. You might say, well, you, you, you continuously... Uh, repeating these things. It's important for us to repeat these things because one passage of scripture, Paul says, uh, put, in, put them into remind, remembrance uh, of this, this, this gospel. As a good minister, continue to give them repetition. There's some things that we need to learn and we learn it through repetition. You know, uh, you have math in uh, elementary school, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and twelfth grade. You have English in all of those grades. You, you have repetition. You keep on building on the foundation. So that's how we learn. A lot of times within, uh, in church, what we do is we like to give you something brand new every day. You didn't get what was said last week. You need, you need to expound on what you learned last week. So therefore that you can add a little more to it, add a little more to it because the word of God is just absolutely wonderful. The Bible says to that, you know, that we can basically explore the very, the, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Christ is the message of the Bible. And so there's a lot of unsearchable riches that are in Christ. And so we can explore that by itself. The Bible says in one passage of scripture that even the angels and we will be looking to salvation for eons in time. For eons we'll be talking about the grace of God, talking about salvation because there's nothing more greater than salvation for your soul. Amen. When studying salvation, you need to understand three tenses of the, of the scriptures. Amen. Of salvation. Three tenses. One thing about the Bible, the Bible is, is a historical book. Amen. But you got to also, in terms of your interpretation of the scripture, you've got to learn how to conjugate and begin to really understand the three tenses of salvation. Amen. There's a past tense, there's a present tense, and there's a future tense. There's a past tense, there's a present tense, and there's a future tense. And if you don't understand that revelation, you can easily mix things up. Some stuff that the Word of God is talking about for the future, you'll be trying to apply for today. And some things that God has already done, you'll be trying to say you need to get it. Well, you don't need to get it because it's already been done. It's already done for you. So you need to know the past tense, the present tense, 
and the future tense of salvation. Second Kim, uh, Timothy, rather, Second Timothy, chapter one, verse number nine. Let's go go with me just for a few minutes as we explore this. A gift that keeps on giving. A gift that keeps on giving. Second Timothy chapter one verse nine says, "Who hath saved us? Who hath? H a t h. Who hath? Past tense. Who hath? Christ hath saved us. Who hath saved us? And what? And called us." with a holy calling, amen, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began. Timothy, Paul says to Timothy here, who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not according to our works, what we've done. It's not based on our performance. Not according to what we have done or what we do. Amen. He saved us not according to what we do. He saved us not according to our works. He saved us not according to anything that had to do with us. He saved us, period. Amen. And called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. Remember, everything is in Christ. If you're saved, you're in Christ. Your blessings are in Christ. Everything you need is in Christ. He says, was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. The past tense, he hath saved us. Amen. And you need to know that because a lot of times people will talk about what you need to receive when he hath saved us. Amen. The past tense of salvation is the foundation of salvation. I'll repeat that again. The past tense of salvation is the foundation of salvation. The past tense is fundamental. The future tense and the present tense is built on the past tense. In essence, uh, before we start talking about what I need to do to, uh, as a saved person, or even as, uh, in, instead of talking about what I'm going to receive in the future, I have to understand that the past tense is the foundation of my salvation. You, you'll understand this uh, in a minute because I don't know if I've ever heard anybody preach this in, in a church. For uh, the, first, the, the, the future tense and the present tense is built on the past tense. So the past tense is that he has saved us. That's past tense. We are saved. We didn't save ourselves. Who did it? He saved us. He has saved us. In essence, it's already done. And that's really what our message is to even the unbelievers, is to let them know that uh, when we have the word of reconciliation, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, is really to let them know that the debt is canceled. Your sins have been forgiven. All you got to do is believe the gospel. Amen. The past tense, he has saved us. Amen. And therefore, for us to be saved, it means that we have a Savior. Uh, I know that sounds pretty simple, but for, in order for us to be saved, it means that we have a Savior. Why do we have a Savior? Because we could not save ourselves. We did not have the ability to save ourselves. He saves us. He keeps us. And we are in his hands. So the Savior did the work. Who did the work? The Savior. You can't work for salvation because it is a gift. And it is a gift that keeps on giving. It, 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 it's giving now and it's going to give even in eternity. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So therefore, he saved us. He did the work. Amen. He did the work on the cross. So the Savior did the work. And we are beneficiaries of what he has done. 
Amen. Thank God we are beneficiaries of what he's done. Salvation is the finished work of Christ. Amen. What, what does that mean, the finished work of Christ? It means that what he did on the cross, he will never do again. He will never have to sacrifice himself again. He will never have to die again. In the Old Testament, the, the priest had to go every year to sacrifice uh, pigeon doves and, and, and heifers and all kinds of things on the behalf of the sins of the people. Every year he had to make these sacrifices. But the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus uh, is the perfect sacrifice. And when he sat, was sacrificed, he did it once and for all. There is no more sacrifice for sin because he is the eternal sacrifice for sin. You say, well, why, what does that mean to me? It means that your sins have been forgiven and your sins are canceled out because he is the eternal sacrifice for sins. Amen. We must understand that salvation is completely the work of Christ. Amen. Which is, is, is his present tense salvation. It is, it is completely the work of Christ and not yours. It, 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 you know, growing up in the church, uh, uh, I, I, even with these historical pictures, growing up in the church, there was a sense that uh, Christ saved you. Yeah, but you better, you, better, you better make sure you keep saved. You better stay saved. So what happens is a lot of times uh, growing up, we got saved every revival. Every revival we'd have some. We would have revivals in the summer, and then sometimes we'd have some in the winter, but every every summer we had a revival. And I can't tell you how many times we got saved. We got saved again, and saved again, and saved again, and saved again. But the reality of that is, is that the, 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 the reality is that when Christ saved us, first of all, when we were born again, he, we're not going to be born again and again and again and again and again and again. We're born again into the family of God one time. Amen. And the Bible says that God comes and he makes his abode in us. It is the finished work of Christ. Amen. It is completely his work, and there's nothing that I can do except to receive the free gift of salvation, which is the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Paul says in Romans 5 and 10, I repeat it, for if we were, were when, when we were enemies, that word enemies means, amen, uh, uh, basically when we were criminals, amen. You know, we were outlaws, we were rebels. Why? Because we were doing things that broke the law. We were so, you know, you know what you do with people that break the law? They're criminals. Mm -hmm. If people break the law, you're, you're an outlaw, you're a rebel. Amen. When you are when you are a lawbreaker, you're a criminal. All of us have sinned and come short to the of the glory of God. Amen. So we were all criminals. We were all rebels. Amen. We were all guilty before God. But the Bible says here in Romans 5 and 10, he says, for if when we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of himself. What does it mean to be reconciled? It means to be brought back into fellowship, brought back into relationship, brought back into fellowship with God. We were brought back into fellowship while we were rebellious, while we were enemies, while we were criminals, while we were uh, rebels. The Bible says we were brought back into relationship with God, not by our actions, but by the actions of the work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says we were reconciled to God by what? The death. There's that gospel thing, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It says we were reconciled back to God by the death of his son. Being reconciled, we shall be saved uh, uh, by his life. Being reconciled, we shall be. So you see a past tense, you see a present tense, and you see a future tense. 
that shall be saved is talking about when he comes, we shall be saved, amen, because of what he has done. Because of the past tense, the present tense, we're going through a salvation. We're going through the ongoing work of salvation, which is the, the work of sanctification that is making us more like Christ every day. We're becoming more Christ-like. But the ultimate thing is that when he shall appear, we will be just like him and we shall be saved. So we have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. We'll talk more about that. The gift that keeps on giving. Amen. Praise God. So there is nothing that I did to contribute to my salvation. You need to type that in the, in, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the comment area. There's nothing that I did to contribute to my salvation. Because salvation is strictly God's. Salvation is strictly the work of God. There's nothing that you can do that can warrant and that can bring salvation in your life except for to believe the gospel. You must believe the gospel. Now, we don't believe in uh, uh, this, this thing that everybody's saved and nobody's going to hell. No, some people are going to hell, but the bottom line is you've got to believe the gospel. Amen. And so, therefore, we are still criminals, rebels. He reconciled us to himself in our rebellious state. So there is nothing that I did to contribute to my salvation. He reconciled me uh, to himself in my rebellion. Amen. Praise God. And so therefore, we have to believe that and understand that the ongoing work is available because the, of the finished work that took place in our lives. If there was no finished work of salvation, there could not be no ongoing works, work of salvation. In essence, we, we could not, uh, the, the work of God, the ongoing work could never work in, unless there was a finished work. Amen. Unless there were a past tense work that was working in our lives. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5 deals with the past tense of salvation. That's how the book of Romans is put together. Romans chapter 3 to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5 deal with the past tense uh, uh, of salvation or uh, praise God. And then you go over to uh, starting at uh, Romans chapter 6, you'll talk about the ongoing work. You'll read scriptures like Romans 6 and 11. Romans, Romans 6 and 11 says, likewise reckon ye, your, ye, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. In essence, count yourself to be dead unto sin. In essence, in, in, in essence, because of what Christ has done for you, then you ought to walk like you, uh, uh, that there's no sin there. Amen. You ought to talk like there's no sin there. You ought to live a lifestyle that is sin-free in the sense or sinless or, or at least be cognizant of what the Word of God says because of what Christ has done in your life. And so he says, likewise, reckon yourselves or count yourselves uh, to be dead indeed unto sin. You are dead indeed unto sin, but what alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not, he says let not, which means you got to give permission to it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Don't let it have residence. Don't let it have rulership. Don't let it reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. This is not the condition of salvation. Amen. It, it, when he says that, that is not the condition of salvation, but because you are saved, we ought to live. Uh, we should not allow it to reign in our lives. You were saved through his death. Amen. You were saved by what? Through his death. Now that you are saved, let me uh, let not sin rule in your body. Because now you are now a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe 5 and 17 lets us know that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. Now that you're a new creature, all things have passed away. Behold, uh, the ongoing work, all things have become new. Amen. Now you got a new life to live. You have a new way to live because of the past tense. Now you have the ongoing work of salvation in your life. Amen. You were saved through his death. Now that you are saved, let not sin rule in your body, but rather sin rules 
in your body or not, amen, does not cancel the fact that you are saved. Amen. Praise God, because your salvation is based on the finished work of Christ. It's based on what Christ has done. Amen. Praise God. But the ongoing work of salvation empowers you to live a victorious life. What does the ongoing work do for you? It empowers you to live a victorious life because, because you are saved. Reckon or consider or let not sin therefore reign in your own uh, your mortal body. Here is why. If you let sin reign in your body, it will not allow you to enjoy your salvation. Amen. Amen. So if you allow sin to reign in your body, it will not allow you to enjoy your salvation. There are a lot of people that are believers. There are a lot of people that are saved, but they're not receiving the benefits of their salvation or they're not enjoying salvation because they're still living rebellious even in that state. Amen. Their spirit is saved. Amen. They're born again. Amen. They're born of incorruptible seed. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and they are complete in Christ, but because they are carnal, Amen. Because they are not living according to the scriptures, they're not enjoying their salvation. You can enjoy your salvation when you align, align yourself with the word of God. When you align yourself with what God has said in his word, you can have joy in your salvation. Amen. Praise God. So, but there's an ongoing work that goes in our lives. Amen. And so why is this important? If you let sin reign in your body, uh, it will not allow you to enjoy your salvation. James 1 and 8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. He lets you know that he's in stay unstable in all his ways. He's not happy. He's not at peace with himself because he's double-minded. Amen. Praise God. Good understanding gives favor, but the way of a transgressor is hard. Proverbs says, uh, Proverbs 13 and 15 says, Proverbs 13 and 15 says, good understanding giveth favor. When you got good understanding, you'll have favor. Amen. But the way of a transgressor is hard. Amen. So therefore, they might be saved, but because the way of a transgressor is hard, you're not going to be at peace. You're not going to have the joy. You're not going to have the, 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 the benefit of salvation if you are a transgressor. Amen. Romans 5 and 17 is for if by one man's offense death reign by one much more, they which receive the abundance of grace. I love that. Receive the abundance of what? The abundance of grace and, the, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. He said basically what he says is that by one man, which we know is Adam, amen, death reigned. And even he says not only death reigned, but much more they which received the abundance of grace. Just like uh, when Adam sinned, it brought sin on the whole world. But when Jesus came, Amen. We receive the abundance of grace. What is grace? The unmerited favor of God. We have favor with God, not based on any merit of our own. We have favor with God. It's almost like that unconditional love, that agape love. We have favor with God, not based on how good we are or how wonderful we are, because none of us are good. None of us are wonderful enough to earn a favor with God. It was because of the extended grace that God gave to us that we have favor. So he says that the abundance of grace, amen, and of the gift of righteousness, once you are saved and because you have that righteousness, that gift that is righteousness, he says you reign in life. You're reigning in life by one Jesus Christ. He said, so if you have Christ in your life and you have the gift of righteousness, because remember, righteousness is a gift. You can't, see, we spend a lot of time talking about doing righteous, but really true righteousness is a gift. Righteousness is a gift. Now, doing the works of righteousness is the ongoing work. 
So the past tense is that the gift of uh, the gift of, of that righteousness is a gift, amen. But the but but when we talk about the 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 uh, the works of righteousness, that is talking about the ongoing work. So our righteousness is really not based on what we do; it's based on what Christ has done for us, amen. The gift that keeps on giving, amen. It says that we are reign in life by Jesus Christ. We ought to have victory in every situation because we are righteous. Righteousness gives us the ability to reign. Amen. Sin can uh, can kill you before your time. So another reason why we don't want to uh, deal, deal with sin because it can kill you. It, it can cut your life short. Romans chapter 6 verse 23, Romans 6 and 20 says, for the wages of sin uh, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. John, uh, James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, James 1 and 15 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticing. Amen. Amen. Uh, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Amen. So therefore, we want to live as Christ would have us to live, the ongoing work. Why? Because sin brings forth death. When you, uh, when you got born again or saved and received Christ, your sins were forgiven. Past tense. Amen. You are saved. Now, if you sin, sin may not take you to hell, but sin will bring hell to you. Amen. You might say, well, what is he talking about? Because if Christ has taken care of all of that, amen, you got to understand that sin was taken care of on the cross. Amen. All of our sins, past, present, and future, were laid on Jesus Christ on the cross. Sin will torment you and, and, and may kill you faster and earlier. Amen. So you don't want to do, you don't want to live a life of sin because you might leave here before you before your time. 1 Corinthians 5 and 5 says, to, uh, to deliver such a one unto Satan. This was a man who uh, had uh, had his father's wife in, in, the, in, the, in uh, the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. He had done something and Paul wrote to them and he said, listen, there's a man over there that must have gone with his stepmother. I don't know what world that was about. He says, you know, he he, he, y'all allowing him to continue and function uh, in this state, in y'all's church. Amen. There in Corinth, Corinth. And he says, what? Deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. A lot of times people stop right there and they say, well, he went to hell. No, he didn't. The Bible says that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Amen. So they said, you go ahead and count him as a sinner. Count him as a rebel. Amen. So that his spirit might be saved in the day of, our, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you will go to heaven, but you, uh, but you wouldn't have enjoyed living life here on earth. So you don't want to live a life of sin. Number three, God wants to uh, have a deliberate relationship with man. God wants a relationship with you. Amen. Salvation restores that relationship. When I live saved or allow God to do the ongoing work in my life, it brings joy, peace, and even confidence. It brings favor and open doors. The ongoing work in my life transforms my life. Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, what? That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is just your reasonable worship. Amen. He says, and be not conformed to this world, which is the next verse. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? That you may prove. Amen. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Why should we live right? Why should we uh, allow the ongoing work of Christ to work in our lives? First of all, so that we may prove what is that good. Amen. 
And that's, that proof is based on our lifestyle. Amen. Prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Romans 6 and 13 says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That is the ongoing work. Amen. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, he's, 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 he's taken my sins, but now I'm deciding to live my life according to the word. And he says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Amen. I've, I've sinned. I've, I've received the gospel. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But now how do I respond to the gospel? I respond to the gospel by now deciding to live a life that is pleasing to God. Neither yield yourselves, your members, uh, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Amen. You, you remember he says, reckon yourself to be dead in one scripture. He says, you got to yield yourselves uh, uh, unto God. Amen. As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now that he has, I've accepted him in our life. Now I need to live a life that is pleasing to him. It tells you that Christ has done for what Christ has done for you. Then it tells you about the ongoing work. Remember, the first few chapters of the book of Romans talks about what Christ has done in chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, but in chapter 6, he then talks about how you should respond to what he's done. Amen. The ongoing work of salvation does not bring justification. Romans 4 and 25 says, who has delivered for our offense and was raised again for our justification. Only the work of what Christ has done that brings justification in our life or salvation. We are not justified because we have, have done something good. Amen. We are justified because Jesus rose from the dead. His resurrection is our justification. Praise God. Because he rose, we are justified in him, which means that we are saved. Amen. His justification. He, his, his payment his, uh, uh, of our sins was on the cross. And because of that, we have the victory to that. Amen. Romans 5. Uh, Romans 5, chapter 1. I mean, I mean, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith. How are we justified? By faith. Amen. It's because of what we believe. It's the believing of the gospel that brings justification in our life. He says, because we're justified by faith, what? We have peace with God. Amen. Do you have peace with God today? Do you have peace with God? Are you, are you, uh, are you at peace with God? Amen. In essence, uh, do you believe that you're pleasing to God? Do you believe that you have a good relationship with God? Amen. Do you believe that if you were to die today, where you would go? Amen. That's talking about the peace with God. How do I make peace with God? I make peace with God by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he says here uh, that when you've done that, he says we have peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, when we believe the gospel, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into, the, into this grace. Amen. Wherein we stand. Amen. We have access to this by the grace of God. Because of God's love, his unmerited favor. Amen. We have access to, by faith, into this grace where we stand. Our standing with God is not based on our actions. Our standing with God is based on what he has done and our faith in what he has done. And it says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The ongoing work of the Holy Ghost in our lives helps us to reign. He helps us to walk in dominion on the earth. Living saved helps us to enjoy the benefits of salvation. I'll say it again. Living saved helps us to enjoy the benefits of salvation. Ephesians 2 and 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith. By what? By grace are you saved, through faith, amen, and that not of yourselves. I, I, I shared with you earlier today that salvation is the work of God. It's never your work. 
Amen. Praise God. Even though the ongoing work is still him working in you. It's still not your work. It's still his work that's working in you. Amen. The Bible says, he says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. What? It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. It, it, what, what do you, how do you receive a gift? Or what do you do for a gift? You just receive it. Salvation is a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. There's nothing you can do to get it. Amen. You just receive it. Amen. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there's nobody who can boast to you and tell you how wonderful they are, how great they are, and why Jesus ought to save them. You know, well, I've been saved a long time, and, and I've never made a mistake. Well, that's not true. Uh, because just... Uh, uh, the Bible says if you offend in one, you offend in all. Amen. But thank God for the grace of God. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us can boast in salvation. None of us can feel entitled because of salvation. None of us can feel better than other people because of salvation. We should never feel better than or, 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 or superior to anyone because of salvation. Because the salvation that we have it's a gift that God gave us. You cannot contribute to the work of grace. Amen. The moment you do, it ceases to be grace. If you start trying to work and start trying to earn salvation or, or keep salvation, amen, you, you cease, it ceases to be grace. Amen. Yielding your members to righteousness does not make you righteous. Amen. Rather, because you are righteous, Amen. Yield your members to righteousness. Let me say that again. Yielding your members to righteousness does not make you righteous. Amen. Because righteousness is a gift. Remember, we read that. Amen. Rather, because you are righteous, yield your members to righteousness. Paul said, work out your salvation. Amen. Isn't that what he said? Work out your salvation. He said it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> Amen. But guess what? You can't work out something that wasn't already in. You can't work out something that was already that was not already in. It had to be in for you to work it out. Amen. In essence, you cannot work out something that you don't possess. You can only work it out if you already are saved. Amen. So now to the future tense of salvation. Ephesians 2 and 10 simply says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, because we are in Christ, we, have been, we are his workmanship. We are created unto good works. Amen. We're going to do good things because we are his workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he says, on the good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. Amen. Or walk in them. Amen. We are the new creations in Christ. New creations. I am the workmanship of Christ. Amen. Praise God. I, don't let nobody tell you that you jump or that you something uh, that is inferior because you are, amen, the workmanship of Christ. Amen. Philemon uh, Philippians, rather, 3 and 20. Philippians 2, 3 and 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, our life is in heaven, our lifestyle is in heaven, and we're looking for his return. Amen. Aren't you looking for his return? Aren't you looking for the return of Christ? When I grew up, amen, uh, my father preached, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He preached it so much that Jesus was coming soon until I didn't believe that I would ever see the year 20, uh, 2000. You know, uh, Prince had a song, you know, we're going to party like it's 1999 because we did not believe that 2000, we'd ever see it. I believe that, boy, I tell you, they preached it so until I wasn't sure that I was going to ever get married. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to ever have children because Jesus was coming soon. He was coming that day. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And, and they said, listen, you don't want to be found in the movie theater. Don't be at the movie picture show. Amen. Because Jesus is coming soon. 
He might even come before we leave this church service today. Woo! Jesus is coming soon. And then I was scared. I remember, I'll tell you a funny story. My father and I was at home one day. Uh, this was probably, I won't even tell you the year because that would date me so bad. Amen. Just say early 80s. Anyway, um, and uh, me and my father was at home. And uh, I looked for him in the house. And I looked out in the front yard and I saw his car was there. And I looked around. I looked in his bedroom. I went down in the garage. I looked. He wasn't in the garage. He wasn't down. He wasn't in the kitchen. He wasn't in the bathroom. He wasn't in any room in the house. I said, man, where is he? I started getting scared. I said, did the rapture take place? Did Jesus come and leave me? Have I been left? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. They preached it so hard until I was scared that I had been left and that the rapture had taken place because my father's car was outside. But he was nowhere to be found. So I said, let me call my friend. Let me call my best friend, uh, Ronnie Johnson. And if Ronnie Johnson's family is home, if his daddy is home, if his mama's home, then I know the rapture hadn't taken place. My daddy just must have walked down the street somewhere. And I have no reason why he could have been walking down the street because, you know, there was no reason for him to walk down the street. So I called Ronnie Johnson. Ronnie Jr., we called him at the time. So, said, man, Ronnie, man, uh, is your dad home? <laughs> is your mama home? He was like, yeah, my dad is here. I said, oh, okay. He said, why? I said, I can't find my father. Amen. And I, I was scared that the rapture took place. And uh, if your dad is home, then I know uh, the rapture didn't take place. My father was around him somewhere. I don't know. He didn't tell me he was leaving, but he's gone. Anyway, that was funny. That was a true story. I believe that Jesus had come and left me because I couldn't find my father anywhere. The question today is, do you know if you were to leave here today, are you ready for Jesus to come back? If he were to crack the sky today, are you ready to go back with him? Amen. You can know without a shadow of a doubt whether you are saved, amen, praise God. You can know what Christ has done for you, amen. And so therefore, I want to leave that with you today. We are looking for the future tense of salvation. What is the future tense? The Bible lets us know that our bodies will be changed. I'll, give, I'll leave you with this one scripture, amen, uh, found in, praise God, in my notes here somewhere. I can give it to you. First John chapter 3. 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, amen. I'll leave you with this one just uh, uh, as a note. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now. Are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. That's future tense. What we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear. That is when we finally see Jesus face to face. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. Amen. And then he says something in the next verse. He says, and every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself. That's the ongoing work of Christ in our life. But he says, every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. That's a kind of a funny play on words. He says, you are pure, but because you are pure, and because of who Christ is, now purify yourself. I am pure, but I need to purify myself. In essence, I need to allow the ongoing work of Christ to work in my life. I want you to know that 
there's three tenses to salvation. There's the past tense, there's the present tense, which is the ongoing work, and there's the future tense. These bodies is the future tense of salvation. Amen. The Bible says these vile bodies will change. This, change, this body will change in the twinkling of an eye. That's the future tense of salvation. This body still has sin that dwells on the inside, but one day when I get that new glorified body, there will be no sickness in that body. That's salvation of the body. There's a down payment on our bodies. Uh, there will be no sickness in this body. There will be no sin in this body. There will be no problems. You won't get no COVID-19 or nothing else. Amen. In that new body. That is the future. Amen. Uh, uh, tense of salvation. That is the gift that keeps on giving. So salvation is continuously given to you. It gave to you past what Christ did for you. It gave you the ongoing work, which you are now deciding to do, not yielding your lives to sin and uh, but unto righteousness. And then it gives you the future tense, which makes you know and makes you understand that your bodies will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Praise God. Listen, let's take this time to pray as we listen to Brian sing this song because I want you to know that this salvation is forever. Past, present, and future. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for your word because you have given us the gift of salvation. And it's a gift that keeps on giving. Father, we thank you for the past tense of salvation that we have been saved. But Father, we thank you for the ongoing work that you're working in our lives right now. That we yield ourselves unto righteousness. And Father, we thank you for the future tense of salvation. That one day this body will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Father, we thank you for what you've done. For what you've done is complete. There's nothing that is left out. It's a complete salvation. In fact, we are completing you. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I pray for those that are out there today that if they have not given their lives to Christ, that they can know without a shadow of a doubt that they are saved once they believe the gospel. We thank you for it in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. Before we leave today, I want to offer Christ to you today. It's very important for you to know that you're saved. It's very important that you know, have a no soul salvation. Know that you're saved. If you're not sure about that, pray this prayer with me right now. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins, who was buried, and who rose again for my salvation. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, be my Savior, be my Lord. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Thank God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, Send me a message. Give me an inbox message that you pray the prayer of salvation. And God will bless you. We'll send you some information in the mail. We'll keep up with you. God bless you on today. We would like to also encourage you to sow a seed today. You can serve three different ways. You can give through Gimplify, which you'll see the information on the screen. Which is Rehoboth World Outreach Center, which is designation. And then, of course, through the Cash App is dollar sign RWOC2. You can give that way. And then, of course, the third way you can give by mail. Amen. That address is on the screen 245 Holly Street, Vallejo, California. Praise God. God bless you today. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday at the drive-in service that we'll be having here at 11 a.m. Come expecting God to do great things for you. God bless you, and we'll see you again.
God bless you. This is Pastor Danny Jefferson, pastor of the Rehoboth World Outreach Center Church, inviting you this Sunday to come and be a, my special guest at our drive-in service. We're having another drive-in service, and we would like for you to come to be with us. Our service starts at 11 a.m. this coming Sunday, uh, and our address is 245 Holly Street in Vallejo, California. 245 Holly Street. Now, listen, if you come, listen, you got to stay in your car. This is, we we are complying with the laws of the land. We're going to have social distancing. you got to stay in your vehicle. But I guarantee you, if you come, God has a word for you. And remember, uh, you belong here. So come and bring a friend with you this coming, coming Sunday. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you.